Mercedes-Benz, makers of the desirable CL, the innovative S-Class, and the exotic SLS. They're about beauty, they're about exclusivity, they're about luxury, most of the time. Meet the Mercedes-Benz G-Class, the least inspiring looking thing this side of a used serviette. It's big, it's boxy, and it's basic. It is in fact the furthest thing away from a Mercedes-Benz that Mercedes-Benz have made in the last 30 years. After a brief first impression, you'd think that this is a car for anyone who doesn't like themselves very much. The original G-Class was designed in the late 70s and not much has changed since then. Mercedes-Benz says it's got classic lines. I say it, it looks dated. To give you an idea, the original Golf was also designed in the late 70s and looks wise that has as much in common with the current Golf as I do with Ludwig von Beethoven. And he's been dead for 300 years. It is not a pretty car this, and yet, drive it for any length of time and you'll see that it gets loads of attention. Pedestrians, other drivers, petrol pump attendants, they love it. Maybe it's because it possesses an old school charm not seen in many 4x4s lately. Maybe people are just happy that for a change, it's not the classic lines of a Defender or a Land Cruiser they're looking at. It's the kind of car that gets compliments most places you take it, although granted, those compliments are dished out without anyone having seen the interior. If I told you I was driving a Mercedes-Benz 4x4, you'd think, oh, it's got a surround camera system and multi-zone climate control and an 18-speaker sound system. Well, things are a little bit different in the G-Class. You don't get electric windows, you don't get electric mirrors. There's no Bluetooth, there isn't so much as a trip computer. You do get aircon, oh and it does have navigation. It's called the windscreen. You look through it and you use the sun and the stars to find your way around. Surprisingly for a big car, there's a distinct lack of place to keep your stuff. You get a cubby hole and door pockets. The big thing by the driver's left arm is just a big thing. It doesn't open to reveal a refrigerated compartment or connection for your iPod, but that's probably because there's no radio. What you get is just the simple stuff from the motoring days of yore. Four seats, a steering wheel, some gauges, a gear shift lever. The most modern thing you can hope for are a few buttons for the diff locks and the low range. Those buttons are probably the most subtle thing about this car. There's no heavy levers or fancy switches. Just a simple touch turns this car into an off-road monster. If you thought the ML was the best 4x4 Merc could do, well, this makes it look like a bit of a pansy, scared to get its boots dirty. There's only one word for this car, hardcore. I had a look at the info on this G-Class Professional, and besides finding out that it is almost entirely built by hand, I read that Merc claims it's good for forestry, municipal services, or long-distance expeditions, which I took to mean going to the nursery, hauling the trash to the dump, and taking the family on holiday. But after spending some time behind the wheel, I no longer view the G-Class in a cynical way. It just feels bulletproof. 
it feels heavy. Every interaction with the car is solid. You literally have to slam the doors to make sure they're closed properly. And even though it's a tall car, it doesn't ever, ever feel unstable. I was honestly expecting it to be horrible on the open road, in the way that only dedicated off-road machines can be. But it wasn't. Steering response is surprisingly good, and although the 5-speed automatic gearbox can hang on to a gear for a bit too long, it's smooth and easy, and it has a manual select function. The biggest surprise, though, was the motor. This G300 Professional is powered by a 3-litre V6 with 135 kilowatts and 400 newton meters, and it weighs two and a half tons. But the power is delivered in a very un-turbo way. Put your foot down and there just always seems to be a lot of meaty torque, no matter where you are in the rev range. The true test of any 4x4 though is how it stands up to repeated exposure to real-world off-road conditions, which we obviously can't replicate in the short week that we had this car. But I'll say it again, it feels indestructible, and you don't have to spend too much time doing research on the net to find stories of G-Wagons that have covered over 800,000 kilometers. Its off-road credentials are impressive, with 36 degree and 31 degree approach and departure angles, a wading depth of 600 millimeters, and an ability to climb an 80% slope. The brakes take a bit of getting used to, reserving their strongest bite as you reach the end of the pedal, which may prove a little troublesome when negotiating the dirt. And make no mistake, that's what this car is made for. So before you rush off to be the first of your mates to own the latest 4x4 on the road, let's have a quick reality check. First, the price. Which is 774,000 Rand, or about 300,000 Rand more than a Land Rover Defender or Toyota Land Cruiser. This is not the car to buy for the school run. This is not the car to buy just because you have big dogs. This is the car you need if the nearest shops are 40 kilometers away, on the other side of a mountain range, with a river in between that might wash you away if you're in anything less than a G-Class. This car doesn't care about your comfort, it doesn't care about making you look good, it's there to do a job. It's one of the most honest cars I've driven in a long time, and I love it. A drivetrain that's best described as functional does a great job of providing all the lugging power and grunt a real 4x4 like this could ever need, but it's certainly no sports car. The result is an honest and perfectly focused all-terrainer that does what it's meant to do with absolute competence. However, for such a basic tool, the price tag is steep. <laughs> 